Okay, so we'll start the second uh, part of this uh, course on networks. So who is, is going to be given by Sandeep Krishna from uh, NCBS. Again, uh, thanks uh, Sandeep for agreeing to <laughs> give this course. Thanks Sandeep, it's really nice to be here. Um, so I'm going to continue uh, on from uh, Shashi, what Shashi talked about. But uh, I gather from him that he, in some sense, he talked a lot about uh, oscillators and synchronization. Uh, but he didn't really get too much into networks in the time he had. So what I plan to do, since this is about uh, complex networks, I thought we might spend uh, this lecture, maybe the next lecture, focusing a little more on uh, you know, network structural properties of networks, graph theoretic properties, uh, just to give you a base of concepts of how to think about networks. Uh, and, and hopefully, if there is still time, I will try to come back to dynamics uh, of networks later on, uh, come back to some of the kinds of things uh, Shashi talked about, which is uh, dynamical variables living on a network and dynamical systems which are somehow whose network of interactions are under, underlied by some kind of uh, network. Um, so, but before I get into the structural aspects, I mean, I wanted to, the reason uh, Shashi and I decided to start with dynamics is because, I, and I want to re-emphasize this again and again, uh, is that really for a lot of us who do work on networks, uh, the structural aspects and the graph theoretical aspects are interesting, not so much in themselves, but because and if they influence the dynamics. It's the dynamical aspects of various kinds of networks that are often of real interest. And there's all sorts of interesting patterns and stuff happening and interesting phenomena there. And, uh, and therefore, I don't want you to lose sight uh, while I talk about structure. Don't forget that actually there's dynamics. And that's where we started, and, and hopefully I can get back to that. So just to emphasize that point again, uh, I don't know how many of you have actually thought about networks, uh, but maybe some of you have. When you think about real-world systems that you would characterize as networks, maybe you can give me a few examples of what comes to your mind. Any example, sorry? Facebook. So essentially, let's, uh, let me write down a few of these things here. So let, let me call that a social network, uh, since the movie was called that. Of course, there can be many types of social networks. Facebook is not the only one. One can imagine other kinds of things. Friendship networks, people have studied these, uh, right? So what kinds of dynamics can you think about uh, which are related to social networks? Social networks, yeah? Anybody? Being friends, yes. So what kind of dynamical uh, variables could be of interest? What kind of... Uh, Dynamical processes could be of interest over here. Rumor spreading. Uh, so le let me write some of these down. So rumor spreading. Very nice. Maybe I can just uh, uh, generalize that to opinion formation. You know, you talk to your friends, they have opinions, other such like. So you can think about information of some sort usually opinions, reputation, all sorts of things like that, uh, happening on such a network of interacting humans. And these things will change with time, right? That's why it's a dynamical system. Any other? Other examples of networks? Not social networks, anything else? You can... Metabolic networks. So, of course, you know, I work in a biology institute, so I come across... In biology, people talk about networks all the time. Metabolic networks, gene regulatory networks, you know, you can keep talking about networks, protein-protein interaction networks. There are many, many, many biology networks. Let's put metabolic networks down. So metabolic networks, uh, fairly obvious, right? There is flow of energy, uh, flow of matter, carbon atoms are taken, broken up, I mean, in, in some form, uh, something like a bacterium would take in glucose, break it up, into little bits, those little bits get rearranged. So there's a lot of dynamics happening here. So there's flow of, let's say, flow of energy at least, flow of energy, matter happening over there, and the dynamics of that is interesting. Yeah, so there are chemical reactions. So clearly the concentrations of chemicals can be going up and down. All that's part of somehow the flow of matter and energy. Maybe I should put matter in over here. 
So somebody, uh, so yeah, uh, as another uh, example, genetic networks. For those of you who are not familiar with this, uh, in our cells or in a bacterium or any organism you know of, you know that there are genes, and the genes produce proteins which do various functions. But many proteins that are produced, their real function is to turn on or turn off some other gene. And there can be a whole complicated network of genes, which some of which are turning each other on and off. And these systems are used for uh, various kinds of, you know, uh, many, many different kinds of things, but amongst them, sensing the environment and responding to them. So there is a lot of dynamics going on, and it's often involved in sensing, uh, regulation of function, and things like that. So again, lots of dynamics going on. Uh, anything else? More examples. That's surely there are more. Sorry? Okay, neural networks. Everybody must have at least heard. These days with everyone talking about machine learning, you must have heard of deep neural networks and stuff like that, right? So neural networks, clearly. The brain, maybe you can put that all into one. Brain, neural networks. Okay, so I mean, here it's again kind of obvious, right? There's again lots of dynamics. Uh, the dynamics is often involved in some kind of computation, for instance. I mean, I don't, uh, by these terms, I don't mean that these are the only or exclusive functions of these networks. Many of these networks do many different things, computation as well as flow of information and so on. Obviously, the brain is doing all that. But there's all of these types of dynamics going on. Um, well, that's, that's a reasonable uh, coverage. There, there surely are many, many other networks. I, I had some other things. Oh, yeah, one of the early networks that uh, people studied, uh, you know, when networks was getting kind of uh, uh, fashionable and exciting in the 1990s and early 2000s, people were studying networks on all sorts of things. Airport networks was one that was studied a lot. The power grid network in the US was studied a lot. Again, you can imagine already there is dynamics, of course, in all of this, right? And uh, it's interesting to ask how is the structure of the network and the dynamics uh, interconnected? Can the structure tell you something about the dynamics? And that's one of the reasons the field got very excited and fashionable and so on, and lots of physicists got into it. One of the reasons was the hope that there is, uh, from the structure, one can tell a lot about the dynamics. Already from the topological connections of airports or so on, you could maybe tell uh, something about how epidemics uh, spread and, or di diseases spread. So there was all this hope. And that went through an exciting period, and then it come down, and it's not as uh, hopeful anymore, yet there are still things going on in networks with it that are very interesting, and hopefully we'll get some chance to talk about some of those. But overall, I wanted to give you a sense that, for many of us, the, the place that networks are really interesting is the dynamics, because otherwise, think about it, what is a network and what is not a network? So what is not a network? Every kind of system, in some sense, by jiggling around the definitions, you could probably come up with a network definition, right? If I take the molecules of air in this room, and I say, OK, for the next, uh, say, five seconds, I'm going to keep track of which molecule collided with which other molecule, and that will be my network. The molecules are connected or interact if they collided with each other. You could make a network system. Is that going to be useful? That's the question. You can always make a network description but the question is whether it's interesting at all to learn anything about the system we have. We know that for the molecules of air in the system, we have some very good ways of understanding uh, what's going on. We have thermodynamics, statistical mechanics. Uh, in those frameworks, we know how to deal with many questions and answer many questions about what's happening to the molecules of air. Is the network description going to give you something else, something better, something more? In these cases, you can kind of see that the network structure might be related or might affect in some interesting way these dynamics. So these are the kinds of, I mean, I'm just sort of giving you some uh, things to think about of what to even think about as a network. Perhaps, uh, but perhaps not. Again, so, you know, uh, I'll leave this open to you because I don't also know the answer of which system is sensible to write down as a network or not. I've studied some systems, somebody else has studied some others. Maybe granular systems are useful to put down as networks in some situations. Uh, okay, so it's just something for you to think about. Okay, so now I'm going to sort of move 
a little more towards the structure. So let's start building up some concepts on the basis of which we can think about structure and this connection between structure and dynamics. So the earliest uh, network problem that I could uh, find where there was a connection between structure and dynamics and a rather trivial-ish connection, but nevertheless a connection, was this old problem that it goes back to uh, this famous mathematician, you must have heard of Euler, in the 1700s sometime, and he was studying this problem called the Konigsberg problem. Many of you may have heard of this, right? Crossing bridges. So for those of you who don't know, imagine there's like, there is a river, and there were two islands, and there's a river that sort of goes like that and goes on forever on both sides. And there are all these land masses, A, B, C, D. And there are some bridges. And if I remember the problem correctly, this was the problem. So let's, oh no, I think there was only one here. So these are bridges that go across the river, connecting the land masses. And the problem was the following. Can you, is it possible to start on one of the land masses and find a path that visits every bridge and goes over every bridge once and only once. Okay, let's put down a few conditions. Once you start crossing a bridge, you can't turn around halfway. You have to go all the way across. You are not allowed to go over a bridge twice. And it doesn't matter where you start and where you end. And let's imagine this river just goes on forever. So you're not allowed to go all the way around to the source, turn around and come on the other side. Right? So this is in a sense, it's a dynamical problem. Do you, can you find such a path? Is there such a path? Can anybody find a path? You think a path exists? Somebody knows a path, you can tell me. I can try and draw it. No, no, no. Uh, so I'm leaving it open. You can choose where you want to start, where you want to end. We can convert the problem to a problem where I give you, but let's keep it more general for now. Okay, I mean, the last time I tried to do this problem in a class, I, I, drove the, I drew the bridges wrong and there was a path. I hope I've got it right this time. There should not be a path. Did anybody manage to find a path? Okay, but then the question is, we have to prove that there's no path, right? If we do believe... There's no path. You can't just say, oh, I couldn't find a path. One wants to prove it. And that's what Euler did. And that was the beginnings of, I would say, the beginnings of network theory or graph theory, at least. And, uh, you know, for you now, it will be fairly trivial, some of the things I'm going to say, for those of you who have looked at networks. But at that time, it was a fairly good insight from Euler to, to realize that all that matters is the connectivity, right? It doesn't really matter what the shape of the landmass is and so on. So he reduced the problem to a graph, a, a mathematical graph, which had nodes, which I'll label A, B, C, D, right, for the four land masses, and links or edges. So these are called nodes or vertices and links or edges. And there are two bridges that go between A and B, two that go between B and D. And if I've not made a mistake, this is the structure, right? So the problem that was a problem on this landscape becomes a problem on a simpler structure where only the connectivity matters, distances don't matter, and so on. That's really the kind of system where a network description becomes useful because you're bringing it down to this essential features. And that's the only thing that affects that dynamical problem uh, of finding a path. So now we have to find a path starting from a node, any node, and crossing every but every link once and only once and ending wherever. And we want to try and prove that that's not possible for this graph, right? Any ideas? Does anybody, does anybody know the proof? Sure. On a computer, I think you can certainly do this. Absolutely. You can, it's, a, it's a finite problem in a sense. Sorry, uh, I should be a little more careful. These objects are nodes or vertices. And the D 
these objects, the links between them, are links, also called edges. I might keep going between these names. Yes, you had, uh, you had an idea. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Very good. OK. So let's say these are three. No, you're on the, absolutely on the right track. Three, three, three. So the idea is the following. I'll, I'll tell you what Euler's argument was. If you are going to make a path that starts on one node, goes over every single uh, uh, link, and ends up somewhere, you would pass some nodes in between in this path. Okay? Any path that, any node that you do not start on or end on, must, you must have come to it and left it. You may have come to it more than once, but then you would have left it more than once, right? If you come to it, but don't leave it, or you, you come and go away and so on, and then eventually come there, it will have, there will be an odd number of times you have approached it through a bridge, right? So suppose you have such a path, and such a path exists, then every node in between must have an even number of links, right? Must have an even number of links to other nodes. And it's only two nodes that are allowed, at most two nodes, that are allowed to have odd number of links. The one you started with, the one you ended with. Of course, you could have a situation where everything is even, and you started somewhere, went various places, came back to the same place. That would be a case where everything had an even number of links. But in this case, so the statement we can make here is that it's not possible for this graph, because this graph has too many nodes with odd number of links. If I start here and I end there, I can't, I can't make it work because these nodes and these links, if I'm going over any of these links, I would be visiting one of these vertices and I would have to come away from that vertex because I'm ending somewhere here, let's say here. And therefore, this vertex must have two or four or six links. Is that argument clear? So we're not talking, this argument doesn't work for all graphs, for instance, doesn't work in particular for all even ones, and that we can make the criteria more, uh, we can do a more rigorous job and expand the criteria to that. But for this graph, you can already see that it's not possible. Okay? So the point is, he was able to connect this sort of more dynamical kind of problem to a, a local problem about some property of each node. And these, these kind of numbers, they are called the degree of a node. So the degree of a node, which is a local structural property, a graph theoretic property, uh, becomes important for some kind of dynamical problem. And I've picked a particularly trivial, simple dynamical, well, trivial for now that we know the answer, uh, problem, just to illustrate that connection. Uh, over the course of the lectures, maybe we'll talk about more complex uh, dynamics, and there we'll, it'll be more complex features of the graph and the structure that will go into determining the dynamics of that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit. Any questions about this? Let's talk a little bit about uh, other features, other graph theoretic features that are normally used when people talk about graphs and networks. And let me begin by asking, how would you, somebody mentioned, you know, you would, one way you could solve this problem is put it on a computer and then just go through every single possible path and see what happens. So how would you represent such an object, this object, on a computer. So somebody said matrix, good, all right. Anything else? We'll talk about this in a second. Any other way? Sorry? What do you mean? I mean, just expand on what you mean. I'm not sure I understood. Any other way? You're representing, sorry. Ah, so connected vertices, like a list of connected vertices? So, all right, so, yeah, you could take a list, you could say A is connected to B, A is connected to B again, maybe, if we have multiple edges, B is connected to C, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In the matrix, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, what people meant was, imagine a matrix that has, in this case, there are five, sorry, four nodes, so imagine a four by four matrix. 
and I'm going to put down uh, an entry that's zero if there is no link between those nodes, uh, and one or two or whatever if there is. So in this case, you'll have something like A is connected to B, well, twice, but B is also connected to A. Uh, A is, is connected to C, A is not connected to D. Something like this. Let's, let's just complete this for, for completeness sake. B is connected to C. Tell me if I'm making any mistake here. Yeah. So the two, I've put down two because there are two links. We can discuss this. Just hold on a second. Uh, let me write this down, and then we'll talk about uh, how would, why uh, one is putting various numbers. OK, C to A. C to A, yes, there is a link. C to B, there is a link. Uh, C to itself, we'll talk about all these conventions in a second. Uh, C to D, one. D, D to A, nothing. And D to B, sorry, maybe two, one, zero. OK, so I have made this kind of a matrix. For those of you, some of you would already know this. It's called an adjacency matrix. I mean, it's just telling you what's connected to what. M, I, J, essentially is 0 if there is no link, and non-zero if there is a link between i and j. OK? Now, there are many ways one can expand this concept. And I'm not going to go into all of them, but you can see here that this matrix is symmetric. right? It's symmetric because these links are not directed. They have no direction. This is what is called an undirected graph. An undirected graph. If there is a link from A going to C, there's a link from C going to A. So A going to C and C going to A are going to be the same. So this matrix is going to be symmetric, right? You can easily have another kind of graph where maybe there were directions, and maybe this was the case, and there was something like that. You can easily use this representation to take care of that. It just means A, this element and that element are no longer necessarily the same. OK, so this, the matrices may not be symmetric. Another point is these diagonal elements. Here I've put them 0, but that's kind of a convention. If in this problem, I mean, I'm not really worried about paths that are floating around here, so I'm not so worried about whether from A you can go to A, because the problem was like that. There might well be other problems where you do have to worry about it. Very often in some of the networks you've mentioned here, genetic networks, for instance, the protein that is produced from a gene goes back and affects the same gene that it was produced. Then you might actually want to keep track of what are called self-links or self-loops. And you might want to give elements over there. That depends on the kind of problem. A ah, directed network. Um, well, let's see. I was going to say airports, but I suspect most airport networks are undirected. If you go one way, they probably go. But not always. There might be certain loops where you know the way back is not the same. Let me think of, uh, see, all the, a lot of biological networks are clearly directed. Uh, the brain and neural networks are very often directed. Very often, there is, uh, if you know how the connections between neurons work, there is a neuron. It has a bunch of uh, outgrowths which go and connect to some other neuron. And the action potentials or the information flows from one to the other, not necessarily back. Sometimes it can flow back. But there are many, many examples where the, it flows only one way. So I, I would say, let's look at these. I mean, they, these are very typically directed networks. This is probably very often an undirected network, but sometimes not. If we made a social network out of you guys, uh, maybe by taking a definition. You can try this in the tutorial if you want. Suppose I set the definition in the last few days of your uh, of the school. How many people have you had a five minute, at least five minute scientific conversation with? Okay. It might happen that you may say you've talked to that person and they say what? <laughs> I never talked to you. It's it's not impossible. So. That would be an, a, a directed network. But I suspect in many, many cases with social networks, you are talking about information that flows both ways. Friends talk to each other, et cetera. Um, if you send messages to someone on Facebook, they probably have sent a message to you at some point back. 
if you're not doing something unpleasant. Uh, so, you know, there are many examples of such things, right? Similarly, you know, there's a convention here. There are, here, there was a case where I was worried about two different bridges, and I did want the problem to deal with a path that goes like this and then goes back, and really, that's different from a path that just does this. So I wanted to keep track of how many bridges there were, and therefore, putting in a two kind of makes sense. But in other cases, you don't care. If there's a link, there's a link. You don't care if the link is somehow doubled or twice. So there might be graphs and, and networks where multiple edges between the same nodes are disallowed, and some cases where they are allowed. Again, it all depends on the problem you're interested in and what network you're looking at. But in general, you can see that this kind of, by the way, this is, I mean, this is really the same structure. It's just a different structure in, in terms of how you might implement it in a computer. One has uh, certain properties, one has other properties in terms of how much space, how much memory they will take, how much time it may take to use them for various kinds of graph theoretic algorithms. But they are mathematically really the same amount of information, right? You could keep track of things like uh, the strength as a separate array, which kept track of like, uh, sorry, if you're, if you're repeating the links, you don't have to keep track of that. But if you wanted to save some space, you could keep track of the numbers separately and so on. These are just, I'm just throwing out ways you can uh, think about networks in a little more concrete sense, because maybe you would actually like to do this in one, in one of the tutorials and actually implement some networks and see. So the question is, uh, so now we have uh, a matrix representation. Let's get on to a few more concepts and uh, talk about how this matrix representation is a very nice way to think about concepts like paths and so on. So I guess everyone knows matrix multiplication, right? So suppose I have defined this now. Let's, let's imagine a graph which has uh, none of these. Let's imagine there's only one link at most between a pair of edges. Let's keep it undirected, OK? So an undirected graph with no multiple edges, uh, at most a single edge between a pair, so your matrix will end up looking something like 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, whatever, something like that. Yeah? Maybe. What does m squared tell you? And you'll have to think a little about the definition of what a matrix multiplication like this is. What do you think the ijth element of m squared will tell you? I'll write down how you would write this. Sorry, say again? Right. But how long a path? Right. So that's the point. Since you can write this as I M M I K M K J, notice that this is going to be non-zero only if there exists at least one K such that I has a link to K and K has a link to J. Right? Now suppose there are more than such, uh, more than one k value that has this property, then there are probably many different paths that go through here. Maybe I should write that. And all of them go to j. This would give you m squared ij equals 3, right? Because there are three nodes that go. So it counts. So m squared counts. Uh, the number of size two paths, okay? If you look in general at m to the power some n, then the ijth element of that would tell you how many paths there are from i to j through, with, which has n steps. But notice, I mean, those paths could retrace each other, right? There's, there's no reason why in a long chain you could not go from i to say 2, and then to 10, and then back to 2. And then even if this was a directed graph, I was actually talking about an undirected graph. And then back again to 5, and then to, and then to j. That's a perfectly valid 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 
which would show up in M5 IJ. Yes? So you have to be a bit careful depending on what kind of paths you're talking about. If you want self-avoiding paths, so to speak, you would have to do a little more work to try and get it from this matrix representation. Okay, but nevertheless, you can see how paths and so on can come about. What about the, let's say, the diagonal element of, let's, let me say, M cube. The diagonal elements are interesting because they're talking about paths from a node to itself, right? So you're asking about cycles. So MN tells you something about paths, and the diagonal elements of MN tell you something about cycles. Okay, so now we're getting a few concepts through. We've talked about degrees, we've talked about paths, we've talked about cycles. Paths, uh, one of the kinds of concepts that's actually very, very useful and very studied in, a, in networks is the concept of a shortest path, okay, between two nodes. So like I said, in this example, from I to J, there was a path of size 5. But that path went on a little detour, came back, then went. And clearly, I to 2 to 5 to J was a shorter path. Maybe there was an even shorter path in the particular network you're thinking of. So you can clearly see for every pair of nodes, it's possible to define a shortest path if they are connected. They may not be connected at all. We'll come back to connectivity a little bit later. But if there is a path between two nodes, you can define the shortest length of that path, right? So shortest paths are very interesting. And uh, do you have any idea how you would find this on a computer? You have the matrix, let's say. How would you go about finding the shortest path from node A to node D if I gave you this matrix? Yeah. Yes, so if it's m squared, you would find out two uh, paths of length 2. If it's m cubed, it would be paths of length 3, and so on. Ah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly my question. How do you find it? Yes, so that's certainly one way of doing it. Now, that's quite, but that's absolutely fine, right? Uh, at some point, uh, you will find, if they are connected, the smallest value of n for which it's non-zero will be the shortest path. But that's computationally kind of hard to do, right? Uh, maybe not, maybe yes, but if you have a big, huge graph, which is, say, the brain of uh, something, it'll take you a long while to do those matrix multiplication. Can you think of something else? I mean, that's perfectly fine. Sorry? Okay, very good, yeah. So you're getting the idea of that. What you would do, if I have understood you correctly, and I, is you would start from some node. Let's say I wanted you to go from A, or let me, let me call it node 1, and I wanted to find out the shortest path to node 10. Right? You would ask first, which are all the nodes that are connected to I? Maybe it's like uh, 3, 7, 8, uh, 5. So you could make an array and say, OK, I hit 3, I hit 7, 8, and I hit 5. And all the others I've still not hit. Maybe 1 you've already got to. So these are all the nodes that are one step away, whose shortest path is one step, right? There is no shorter path you can have. So anything that's linked to 1 is one step away from this. Now you would go and do exactly the same thing recursive to each one of these. You know, if somebody wants to try this out we, in the tutorial, we can try it. Suppose you ended up hitting uh, 3 again over here. That's the case you have to worry about. If these were all different numbers, um, let's say 4 and so on, no problem. You can start adding to 4 and say 4 is two steps away. Great. What if you hit 3? It's already a node you've already hit before, so you shouldn't actually change the number. And you keep going like this until you hit the node in question, 
oh, you've covered all the nodes, then you actually have shortest paths for everyone. Do, do people get the logic of this? This is a rather useful um, algorithm, which is called the breadth first search. And it's breadth first because you're looking at all the neighbors of a node, and then recursively all the neighbors of that one, all the neighbors of that, all the neighbors of that, all the neighbors of that, before going one step further. So you're sort of covering the width of the network before going deeper into it. There are other kinds of search algorithms. And uh, at some point, if any of you are interested in actually implementing some of these, we can, we can talk about real ways of implementing this. But the logic is clear. This is a way of finding out shortest paths. So now, if you have the shortest paths, uh, an obvious uh, interesting quantity comes up, which is the longest shortest path. OK? What do I mean by that? I mean, you take all pairs, find out the shortest path between them, and then find the pair for which this shortest path is the largest. <laughs> and that's called the diameter. This is the longest, shortest path. Does that make sense? The reason I'm talking about all of these concepts is that these are the kinds of quantities and numbers that when people first encountered these kinds of uh, real networks and had enough information to make out the network in sufficient detail. These are the kinds of quantities they measured. So it turns out uh, that for these kinds of real networks, the diameter is quite short. We'll come back to what, I'm, what I mean, or small, let me say small. The diameter is relatively small. Intuitively, we'll come back to this in, in more quantitative detail, but intuitively, it turns out for many of these networks, social networks and so on, it doesn't take very many steps to reach anyone you like in the network. Even if they, they are not really your friends, they're quite far away, actually it doesn't take very many steps to get there. Some of you may have heard of this, uh, this uh, notion of six degrees of separation, right? That's sort of where it comes from. There's a bunch of social networks, uh, this, uh, Kevin Bacon uh, network, Airdos uh, networks, and so on, where people found that, well, I mean, six may or may not be the correct number, but the number is not much different from six. It might be a little lower, it might be a little larger. But imagine all the actors who have worked in Hollywood movies, and everyone is only about six steps away from Kevin Bacon. It's not an obvious... So the question is, is that something to be surprised about or not? And that's the kind of question we will try to hit at a little bit later in this lecture and in the next lecture, to ask, what does small mean? What does large mean in this context? What should one's null expectation be? Should one be surprised by the kinds of measurements we make here or not? But it turns out, I'll tell you for now in a, in a more intuitive sense, that for all these networks and many other networks that people studied in the 90s and 2000s, the diameter turned out to be pretty small. The nodes would be like thousands, and yet the diameter would be something like five, six, four, okay, ten maybe. So we'll come back to that and talk about that. But that's one reason that people, uh, that I'm bringing up these concepts of diameter and shortest paths and so on. We talked about degrees. Degrees also is something that uh, was very uh, part of the reason why people and a lot of physicists got excited about uh, networks. And it's because they started looking at, well, not just the degree of a particular node, but the degree distribution. So you could take all these degrees in this graph and make a frequency histogram, right? Here, of course, there are only four nodes, so the histogram will look a bit discrete and disconnected. It's, it's not going to be very informative. But imagine very large networks like the brain, the internet, the World Wide Web, uh, metabolic networks, genetic networks. Each of these have thousands sometimes more. I mean, the internet has more than thousands of nodes. People started looking at the degrees of those nodes and making these frequency histograms. And they found, surprisingly, that for a lot of them, the frequency histogram, which I will call P of K versus K, 
um, had, well, let me, let me write log, log. On a log, log plot, it had a surprisingly straight line structure, which meant that at least for a certain range, P of k was going as something like 1 over k to the power. And these exponents were often in the range of 2 to 3. Now, one has to be a little careful here, because people got really excited about this and went and looked at every single network they could imagine or construct or create for no reason other than that they could do it and started measuring these things. And sometimes you do find there are large networks like uh, the World Wide Web, for instance, where you actually see this straight line over many, many decades, like three, four decades. Then you can start to believe that, yes, this straight line actually is fairly representative of a power law. And there is something like a power law going on. But there are many, many cases, and I would urge you to be very cautious if you ever read papers about networks. There were many cases where this whole thing would be more like that, and there would be some kind of cutoff there, and there'd be a small region of like one decade or one and a half decades over which there's a straight line. And everybody would get very excited about this power law. One has to be really careful. That's statistically, it, was, it so turned out that later on, one second, Later on, when people went back to some of these old studies and looked at it in a little more statistical rigor, it was not really possible to infer there was a power law at all. Nevertheless, one feature that was there, and that's what I'll, I'll say, is that there was a fat tail. So you guys must have heard about, you know, you must have thought about various kinds of probability distributions, right? And people use the term fat tails. They usually use the term fat tails when the tail of the distribution is not falling too fast, not falling like exponential. An exponential is not a fat tail. A Gaussian is not a fat tail. But something that falls slower than exponential can be called a fat tail. So let me loosely say that the degree distribution of many of these networks was found to have fat tail. We'll come back to this also in a little more detail. You had a question? No, it's because, because what, I, what I mean is that if you have something over, let's say this is 1 and 10, and that's 100, and you have a curve that looks like that, anything can look like a straight line over a short enough period. It's not enough to infer that there is a power law. Okay? This could be a power law with a sort of a cutoff, an exponential cutoff or some other cutoff there, or it might even be an exponential. And there were many cases where people found that actually, once you do the inference really rigorously, they could not distinguish reliably between a power law or an, even an exponential or some other kind of thing, like a stretched exponential or something. So one has to be, it's just a note of caution. There was a lot of excitement uh, in that period when people were looking at degree distributions because physicists love power laws. Let's face it, you guys are all in a statistical physics school. There will be lots of power laws. Even I'm going to talk about power laws. And we love power laws because they are linked to phase transitions and other interesting phenomena. And that's what got people excited. Are there interesting you know, phase transitions happening in these networks? Are there self-organized critical phenomena that are bringing out power laws in these networks? And that's why they got excited. But sometimes you can get overexcited. So be careful when you read the literature. Don't believe people when they say power laws without checking yourself. But nevertheless, let's say it's a fairly robust statement, I think, to make. Whether there's a power law or not, there were fat tails. And what fat tails really mean is that there are some nodes with very, very large number of connections. Not too many and few. And there are many, many more nodes with smaller numbers of connections. But there are some of these hubs, as they call them, uh, in many of these real networks where they have a surprisingly large number of connections. Okay. And that can have a lot of effect on the dynamics, on epidemic spreading, all sorts of stuff, even synchronization, like Shashi was talking about, and so on. We'll come back to that a little bit later. But I wanted to point out these sort of structural features of real networks that people noticed when they first started looking at these large networks. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So imagine. <clears throat> I mean, so the shortest, shortest path is also important. 
But the kinds of situations where the longest, shortest path is important is in, uh, it depends again on the dynamical question you're interested in. So imagine you're interested in sort of disease spreading. So disease spreading is a case where you want to know how long, if somebody gets infected and there is a certain infection rate, uh, how long before the, it engulfs the whole thing. That's a case where the longest, shortest path is probably important. There are other cases where you're looking at, for instance, flow of information, and you want some bounds on how long before the information will reach there. Because, well, who knows, maybe there are errors accumulate over time. So if you know the longest time it can take for the, a packet of information on the internet to go from one node to the other, you can get some sense of uh, what error rates to expect. So there are, in that sense, again, I want to make this connection back to the dynamics. As such, as a structural quantity, it's useful or not useful uh, compared to any other structural quantity, it's as good. The shortest, shortest path is perfectly valid quantity to measure and write down and compare. But it's a question of what is the dynamics you're interested in and whether that has any relation to this. So initially, uh, this kind of stuff, the diameter, uh, one of the reasons this was, uh, uh, people were excited about this is because actually somebody did one experiment. Uh, you might have heard of Stanley Milgram. He actually sent out letters. He asked people to post letters to somebody they know, and, and the aim was to sort of reach a person who was, you know, a few steps far away, and he was looking at the time taken for these letters to reach. And in a sense, he was experimentally, empirically probing uh, path lengths. So it wasn't actually necessarily shortest path lengths there. It turned out that, that uh, those times uh, were related to the average path length, because actually sometimes the letters took a very long path, not the shortest path, because nobody knew how to, what the shortest path was. It turns out, though, that for many kinds of networks, and we'll discuss some of them, the diameter and the average path length also are related. Uh, they're not the same quantity, but they often scale in the same way with the size of the network. So sometimes, you know, again, this quantity may be related to another quantity that you're more interested in, but this may be easier to calculate. So there are many reasons why particular quantities get picked out. Okay, um, a third feature, and uh, I will come back to the question I asked over here somewhere. Let me get rid of all this. Cycles. So one particular kind of cycle was... Uh, was actually very, took some prominence, and that's MQII, right? So in a network, well, let's stick with undirected networks for now. In a network, the diagonal element of M cube tells you about triangles. Yes? Because you start here, you go one step, you go two steps, and then you come back. The only way to come back in three steps is a triangle, right? There's no other way you can come back to the same node in three steps. So people got excited about triangles because they were actually looking at social networks. And they wanted to know if you are a node one and you have two friends, two and three, what's the chance that your friends know each other? And some of this was related to another kind of dynamical problem, which was about how social networks evolve over time. And one of the postulates that people had was that the way they evolve over time is your friends get to know each other, if they didn't know each other before. And so triangles get created more and more. So people started looking at triangles. Absolutely, yes. So triangles are important in spin systems, for instance, because they can produce frustration. Mm. There is a link there. Uh, if you think about opinion dynamics, and people have studied about opinion dynamics, if there are only two opinions you're choosing from, let's say you're going to vote in an election, and there are only two parties, and you're trying to figure out which party to vote for, and you can think of your opinion as a spin sitting on your social network, and you're influenced by your friends, then of course, potentially triangles could cause frustration in your opinions. We won't go into that in any great detail, but I'm just throwing it out as a possible dynamical system where indeed frustration could come about. So, yeah, I mean, so there were, again, many reasons why people get interested in triangles. But this was one of the, one of the things that they were uh, asking was something called the clustering coefficient. So this, this became known as clustering. 
So if you had many neighbors, let's say four, five, six, you can ask, firstly, how many triangles could you have amongst all of these? So how many pairs of friends can you have? If you have six friends, the number of pairs you can have is six choose two, right? That's the total number of pairs you, of friends who could know each other. And you can ask, for every node one, I can define a quantity. Let me get rid of this. I can define a quantity C1, which I will define as the fraction of pairs of friends that are actually connected. So how many friends, uh, how should I write this? Uh, how many of your friends are connected, are linked, let me say, divided by, if your number of friends is k, kc2. This is called the clustering coefficient of that node 1. And now you can average over the whole thing. You can average over the whole network. And this would be called the clustering coefficient of the whole network. So this is another quantity that people studied a lot and measured for all of these kinds of networks. And they generally found that the clustering was high. And again, I'm going to be a little vague here about what high is, and we will come back to that in more quantitative detail. But essentially, uh, it turns out that in a lot of networks, the, the number of your neighbors who are also connected to each other in the real networks turned out to be surprisingly large, a fairly large fraction. Okay. Large, in this case, can mean anything from 0.1 to 0.9 and so on. Uh, but even 0.1 can be very large. And we will come back to what is the correct number to compare with uh, and figure out what, whether 0.1 should be considered a large number or not. But let me for now say that it was large. OK? So there's one more concept that I want to talk about before actually coming down to the question of uh, exactly how do we proceed with this comparison and what kind of null models we can set up to even start answering the question whether this is surprising that these real networks have these properties or not. Okay? And the, the other quantity, the, the graph theoretic feature I want to talk about before we get to that is connectivity. So we kind of briefly mentioned this with paths, right? You can have shortest paths or not shortest paths between pairs, but sometimes the pairs may not even have a path between them. Yes, I can easily think of a network, maybe I will rub this out now. So I can easily think of a network, let's say this, we'll stick with, here's a network where there's clearly no path from 1 to 3, or 1 to 4, or 1 to 5, right? They're disconnected. It's very obvious visually, but sometimes it's not so obvious to know how to even represent this concept, okay? But essentially, uh, there are two concepts in the most general case of an undirect, uh, sorry, a directed graph. There is something called weak connectivity, and strong connectivity. So weak connectivity between two nodes is when there is a path from, say, i to j, and, and I really mean a path. It could, be, it could be long or short or direct, but not necessarily a path going back. So here you would say i and j are weakly connected but not strongly connected. For strongly connected, you need a path from I to J and a path back. And the paths could be different lengths in general in a, in a completely directed graph. There's no reason uh, in a directed graph that it would be the same path or you would reverse your paths. It could be completely different. But the point is, is there a path that goes that way and a path that goes that way? In, a, in an undirected network, these two concepts uh, are the same. There is no distinction between weak and strong connectivity. If they're connected, they are weakly and strongly connected. They are, in general, strongly connected, right? This subsumes that. 
but in an undirected graph, it doesn't even make sense to separate the concepts. Okay, this turns out to be, again, a very useful and important concept in terms of things like disease spreading and all. If you're not even connected, then of course the thing won't even spread. So people are often asking questions like, let's say if you think that the airport network is what is spreading diseases across the world, what are the smallest connections you could break to make different parts of the network disconnected from each other? So what's the smallest intervention you could do? And this becomes important not just in that, maybe you don't want to destroy a, an airport connection, but maybe you could think of uh, disease networks with some kind of vaccination. So where are the places that if you had limited resources and limited amount of vaccines around, but you knew the network, could you figure out which are the best places to vaccinate or the best nodes to vaccinate? Uh, so you can imagine the kinds of questions that people could think up in this kind of context. So this is, there are some interesting uh, things you can do with this. Uh, and let me talk about one of them because that's going to become useful. So I'll rub this out. Any questions before I proceed? Sorry? That this, oh the key, sorry, sorry. This is the number of friends so this is, if you have a degree K, in this case, the degree was six. So if you have six friends, then this would be six C2. That's all. So K was the degree of the node. And that's it. I think nothing more. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, maybe I, I think I, I just, yeah. So five, you're right. Thank you. Here it's five. Numbering, yeah. Yes. Yes, it looks like two graphs. But you know, uh, sometimes that can happen. Uh, so in general, as a mathematical object, a, a graph can consist of two subgraphs that are disconnected from each other. So people talk about subgraphs. Subgraphs, yeah, yeah, so, so exactly. I mean, it's, it's all a question of what again, what kind of question you're asking and what's your, where you're putting the boundaries of your system. Uh, I can say that the brains of everybody together in this room form one vast neural network, but they're, it's very disconnected. It's disconnected into like 60, uh, 60 subgraphs. That may not be very useful because if there's never any link between them, Maybe there's no dynamics between them and therefore it's not useful. But it can be useful sometimes when you think about graphs that are changing with time, where your graph starts off disconnected, but maybe starts getting connected because new links come in and so on. So if one is thinking about systems where the network itself changes with time, sometimes it's useful to keep the disconnected pieces as different pieces of the same system, because as links get added, you're still interested in that full collection. But in, if I was studying neural networks, I would probably not imagine, at least in the near future, that your brain will get connected to somebody else's brain. So I would probably study your brain separately and that brain separately. In that case, very clearly, it would not make sense. I, it would make sense to study this separately and that separately. The, the notion of weak connectivity is very, and the distinction between weak and strong is particularly useful. Uh, but think of it this way. I mean, even when you start with a connected network, for questions such as what, what to hit to make the network disconnected, these concepts come in. So again, like all of the concepts I've been talking about, they're not, uh, don't take any of them as, as sacred or necessary to study for every network you ever study. It's only useful if it leads to something interesting. I'm just setting I'm kind of giving you a little survey of concepts that are widely used because we'll hopefully have time in the later in the course to come back to problems where you will need to use different of these concepts. Okay? Okay. Yes. Okay. So what so his question for those who didn't hear was can you have an adjacency matrix which looks sparse 
but has a small diameter. So there are a few term, terms here, sparse. Sparse, for those of you who don't know, means very few links. Most of the links are zero, okay? Uh, that's sparse. So the first question to ask is, if you want to answer your question is, can you have a very sparse network and it still be connected in the first place, right? Uh, that's that's one question we need to we need to ask. That's certainly possible. We'll come back to this when we study uh, random graphs a little bit. The second question is, can the diameter be small? Yes, that's also possible. So you can have a small, uh, you can have a sparse graph, which nevertheless is connected and has a small diameter. Just hold on to that thought because you'll come back when we study random graphs. You will see some examples of that. Okay. I'll try to, if I don't explicitly answer your question then, you remind me again when we're doing random graphs. But the, the short answer is yes, it is possible. Okay, so we have about half an hour, and uh, I wanted to, uh, so we've talked a little about connectivity and such like. Um, sorry? Okay, so what I wanted to do is actually get a little bit to this question of, ran of uh, random graphs and setting up a good null model to try and look at some of these quantities and ask whether the values we see in real networks are surprising or not. So I will come back to your question faster than I thought. So keep all these in mind. At various points in time, we will talk about connectivity and so on. So let's think about this question. So you want to know if the diameter is small. When I say diameter, I, I take a social network, I find a diameter value. Uh, it looks small because there are thousands of nodes and the diameter is only three, but what do we compare with? How do we say it's small or large, right? And we're going to get to the concept of random graphs here. So I guess, I don't know how many of you have actually encountered this, but I suspect there are a fair amount of you who have never heard of random graphs. How many have never heard of random graphs? Okay, great. So let's. Let's, but you've probably all heard of random numbers, yeah? So we're going to make a, an analogy, and we're going to talk about random graphs in more or less the same way as we talk about random numbers. So what's a random number? A random number is not one number, right? A random number you can think of as a collection of numbers, each of which is associated with a probability, yeah? So suppose you had a dice. In a dice, you have one to six, and each of them is associated, if it's an unbiased dice, with a probability 1 over 6, 1 over 6, and so on, right? If it's a coin, you have heads and tails, which I can call 0 and 1, or something like that. And it's associated with a probability half, or half. But maybe it's a biased coin, and that's fine. Maybe this has a probability 0.3, and this has a probability 0.7. The essential point is that it all sums up to 1, right? So any collection, any ensemble of numbers with an associated probability can be considered a valid model for a random process that's producing these numbers from this ensemble. So I would say a random number between 1 and 6 is something that you would get uh, from a dice. If you keep rolling a dice, you'd get various numbers, and you'd get them with these probabilities. So in a sense, one very neat way of defining a, a random number is a collection of numbers with an associated probability. And that's what we're going to do with random graphs. We're just going to have a collection of graphs and give each one a probability. And now we have to think about how to set that up. So one of the earliest types of such random graphs that was studied was by one of the names one of you mentioned, Erdos and Reni. But there were others, there were lots of others. There was a guy called Solomonov. I mean, these guys are the ones whose name has sort of become associated with the random graphs I'm going to tell you about. But actually, there were a bunch of other people. Um, there was a guy called Gilbert. And all of these people worked in around the 1950s. Okay. So the Eidos, Eidos and Rennie came up with the following. So the first collection of graphs with associated probabilities they came up with is, they said, let's look at all graphs, all graphs G 
or well, let's just say all graphs with n nodes and l links. Let me put this down here. L links. Right? So let's say it was three and two links. Then you'd, you'd actually write down all of these graphs. So here's one graph, right? Here's another graph. Well, they'll all kind of look the same. But if you were numbering them, they might look a little different. So this could be two, uh, three, one, and so on. Suppose I made this one link, then it would be, let's say, this collection, uh, this, this one, and so on. So list all the graphs that have that property, n nodes, n links, and associate each one with an equal probability. So this would be one over the total number of graphs. There are some m such graphs. You can figure out how many such graphs will be there. And associate every single graph with the same probability number. OK, so this is like very much like a uniform. This is like the dice. Every single possibility, and each is given an equal probability. Now, usually, you have to give some constraints on this, uh, even apart from what I've said. So like we talked about before, you can say, does this include graphs with self loops or not? It's, this is stuff you usually specify beforehand. Is it undirected or directed? Right? So let's, for now, stick with, just for simplicity, undirected graphs with no self loops and no multiple edges. So that's the kind of graphs I have here. Right? This is one graph, this is another graph, and so on. Okay? This is, this is one kind of system. Now, what can you do with uh, something like this? Just like with random numbers, you can now use this to make predictions about various quantities. These were the probabilities. Suppose I wanted to ask what the diameter is, or something else. I mean, you know, average degree, let me say here. That's kind of a bit of a thing. But let's say there was some quantity, average this degree, diameter, uh, any of these quantities, uh, C, this clustering coefficient I told you about, you would measure it. This is some graph G1, G2, Gm, and each one has associated a probability P1, P2, Pm, and this quantity would have some value. Let's call it, so this is some function, this is some function of G1, this is some function of G2, this is some function of Gm, right? If you wanted to know the expectation value of the diameter or average k or whatever, how do you calculate this given the probabilities? You would just simply sum over all the graphs and you would sum over f of gi pi, right? i going from 1 to m. This would be the average of, well, let's just write average f. The expectation value of this quantity would be this. Is everyone clear about this? This is how you use probability distributions, right? If you know all the outcomes and each one has a probability, and now you have some kind of observable, uh, me some measurement you can make on each event, and if you want to know the expectation value of that measurement, you just average, you just weight it by the probabilities, right? And here I've assumed that the probabilities all add up to one, therefore I don't have any other normalization. Right? So you can see clearly that if one actually had this entire ensemble of graphs and the associated probabilities, you could, you could in principle calculate everything that you wanted. You could calculate diameters. You could also calculate higher moments. Right? Just as you calculated this, fg, you could calculate the second moment if you wanted. Right? So you can calculate all the moments, you can calculate all such quantities that you want. Is everyone, anybody has any questions about this? Because this is sort of what we'll do in the rest of the... So let me tell you about another 
ensemble that they came up with. This was a very similar, uh, it, it's, it's very similar and it's very related to this one, but it's, it's one way instead of specifying the number of links, you consider the random graph or this ensemble as being created by a random process. So here's the process. You define a probability P and a number of nodes N. You specify that in the beginning. You start with N nodes, which are not connected to each other, and you give every possible link that could be there between any pair. You give it a link by tossing a biased coin, and you give it a link if you get a probability P, and no link with a probability 1 minus P. Okay? In other words, imagine I had this matrix. I would first put zeros everywhere, or I would, let's put it this way, I would go through every single matrix element, I would toss this bias coin, if I got a probability higher than P, or if I got a probability, with a probability P, I would give this a 1, with a probability 1 minus P, I would give this a 0. So you would get some sequence of zeros and 1s, depending on how your coin tosses came out, right? Now, if you wanted this to be an undirected graph, you wouldn't go through all of them, because you want a symmetric matrix, so you would only go through the top quadrant, the top triangle, and the rest would just automatically fill in, right? If you wanted something where there were no self-loops, you would already set all of these to zero, and you'd be only worried about these ones. So you'd go over these ones, toss your coin, the biased coin, and give it a link or not give it a link. Okay? So as a result, you would again have various kinds of nodes. Now, suppose uh, here, let's say n was 3, you, would, you, would, you could get this graph. Right? There is a non-zero probability you would get this. There is, you would get a graph like that. You would also get graphs with two links. You might even get graphs which are fully connected but each will have an associated probability, right? And that we can calculate, and we'll do that in a bit from this. So you would associate this with some P1, P2, P3, P4. Right? Let's imagine this one. This one, I'm going to rub this out. What's the probability that will be associated with the empty, the graph with no links. We're looking at a situation which is only three nodes, right? And it's undirected. Let's assume no self-links. So I've already put in the zeros. This is the only three elements that I'm unsure of, right? So what's the chance you'll end up getting that graph? You would have to have no link here, and no link here, and no link here. So this would be 1 minus p cube. Yes? And so on. So you can easily figure out, given the p, what's the probability associated with this, and it'll all add up to 1. So this is another ensemble of graphs with an associated probability, and you can do all these kinds of calculations. You can figure out the diameters, average diameters, etc. Right? It turns out that these two are very, very similar in the n going to infinity limit. They essentially give you the same result. And since you're in a statphys school, maybe you already can guess at some of the intuition why. Does these, do these ensembles remind you of anything that you have, may have heard of before? Um, yeah, sorry? Binomials, of course they are, you, you can see that there will be a binomial, but I heard somebody else say, microcanonical ensemble. So, you, you guys did a little of microcanonical and canonical ensemble before? No, okay. But how many of you have heard of microcanonical and canonical ensembles? Okay, a fair amount, right? So, you know, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, if you have a, a thermodynamic system, uh, a microcanonical ensemble is a system, a collection of, of these systems where, uh, in each case, uh, each instance of that system has the same energy, a given amount of energy. 
So that's like here, I've said each graph has the same number of links. Here, on the other hand, the number of links could vary. And in a canonical ensemble, that's actually the case. The energy does vary. But you know that when you take the thermodynamic limit, you often get, I mean, you get the same answers from these two uh, ensembles. And you get them because the distribution of energy starts becoming very peaked around the average value and gets closer and closer to a delta function. If I was to ask you here for this ensemble, what's the distribution of number of links across this ensemble? It's a delta function, right? Every graph has the same number of links, L. Here, that's not the case. There is a distribution. There are some graphs with few links, some graphs with lots of links, and some graphs, many graphs with in-between links. So there is some distribution. But the point is that as n goes to infinity, and we can really see that, uh, we can do a little calculation and, and check that, that distribution uh, gets narrower and narrower around the average. And what's the average? So what is the average number of links in this ensemble? So average number of links would be what? You can again think about this. Well, think about this. You have, in this case, three potential places where you're putting ones and zeros. And somebody said binomial distribution, right? Yes, this is, this is just each of these are independent events. Each of these have a probability of success, let's say, if you call that being a link, of p. So in this case, if p is the probability that each of these will get a 1, how many, on average, links will you get? np, right? n, where n is how much? n is 3. If you had a bigger matrix where you had 4, and you'd have a different number, right? This, it would still be NP, but now the N is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. In general, it's going to be, you know, you know how much it's going to be? You can check. It's going to be N, N minus 1 by 2. Okay? So it's going to be N, N minus 1 by 2, P. That's the average number of links that will be had here. You could come to the same conclusion by using this kind of formula with links. So if you knew all these probabilities, and we do know all these probabilities, and you used f of g as the number of links, then you could actually do this sum, and you'd get back the same thing. That's just the binomial calculation. That's actually taking a binomial distribution and finding uh, its average. So we won't go through that, but if you want, we can in the tutorial or something. That's the average number of links. So to be a little more precise, this ensemble and that ensemble will give you the same answers for all possible calculations of this type that you do, provided n goes to infinity, and provided L in that ensemble is related to P in this ensemble by this formula. Is that clear? So we're saying that here you will have a certain average number of links, if that average number of links in this ensemble matches the number of links in this ensemble, then they'll give you the same answer. And there is really, and if we have time, I would like to do that, uh, this connection between the canonical and micro-canonical ensemble can actually be made much more rigorous than what I've just said. Here I've just said, oh, it's something to do with the distribution and it gets narrower and narrower. But actually, one can actually set up a Hamiltonian and do all sorts of things and actually make that connection closer. And I might do that the next time. OK, so let me end. I have about like five minutes. And what I wanted to end with uh, is a quick, um, now that you know these two ensembles, a quick run through of the quantities, the three quantities we put up over here. The diameter, the degree distribution, the clustering. OK, let's just get a sense. For this, this kind of random graph, what these quantities would be. And I'll just sketch out the, the arguments. So um, we're going to work with this ensemble, the, the NP ensemble. I think I rubbed it out. This one. It's just a little easier to calculate. And 
the connection is actually very, very close. So it's just a little harder to calculate things with this one. So we're going to stick with this. So the first question is, uh, let's talk about the degree distribution. So the degree distribution, so you have some matrix, like I said, you have this, right? And you have various ones and zeros, uh, which have been randomly interspersed here. And because it's an undirected graph, it's all going to be uh, symmetric, right? Uh, zero, one, whatever. So the question is, what is the degree of the first node in this, this node? It's just the number of ones that are in a row or column. And because it's the transpose is the same, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at rows or columns. Let's just look at this row. The number of ones and zeros that are there, right? So what's the probability that there will be k ones in this column? What's the probability? You should be able to just tell me. Sorry? No. The probability that the number of ones in this row, is, sorry, this column, is exactly k. So let's say, what is the probability that there are three ones in this column? Yeah? Right, good. I mean, it's just a binomial. It's not, n, because I defined there as being no self-loops, it's actually n minus 1 c3, p to the power 3, 1 minus p, n minus 1 minus 3. Just the binomial distribution. And we're only worried about one row. So that actually tells you the probability that a node in one of these graphs has a degree k. So if I make this in general k, that's this. OK? We are very often uh, going to be working in the limit where n goes to infinity p goes to 0, but pn is a constant. Let me call that constant lambda. Do you know what happens to this distribution in this limit? Poisson, right? So the reason I'm going to write this out, uh, tell me if I've done this wrong, it's uh, lambda to the k, k factorial. Yes? So the question is, this is your degree distribution. Actually, we have calculated for this uh, ensemble the degree distribution. Does it have a fat tail? As k becomes very large, does this fall off exponentially or faster or slower than exponentially? Does it? So think about k factorial. OK, Does it, people know Stirling's approximation? log of k factorial goes as, right, k log k, I mean, I'm just, sorry, k log k minus k, right? So suppose I actually took log of p k, what would that be? Well, minus lambda uh, plus k log lambda minus k log k plus k. So when k is very large, that's the term that will dominate. If it was an exponential, what would it be? Log of pk would be some minus alpha k, right? This is actually faster. So it's actually going to decay faster than exponential. So it's certainly not a fat tail. So we don't have fat tails. It's already not a very good model for our real inputs. Or to put it another way, if you do see a fat tail, under this kind of null expectation, uh, this is surprising. OK? Let's very quickly uh, look at the other quantities. Uh, clustering coefficient, that's actually a, a fairly easy one to calculate. I'll do it here. So imagine you have a node, one, and it has some number of some k neighbors. Yeah? So the quantity we're interested in calculating, we already know that there are kc2 possible pairs of neighbors that could be connected. How many of those on average will be connected? So what's the average number of pairs of, of these nodes, these k nodes, 
that will actually have a link between them. There are KC2 possible links, and each link has a probability of how much? P, right? So there are KC2 link. Each one's independently going to be given a, a link or not with a probability P. So the average number of links you'll see over there is P K C two, right? Which means that your C of this node one is actually going to be P on average across this entire ensemble. So if you average over the entire ensemble and over the nodes, your clustering coefficient. So what do we get here? We got a Poisson for the random, and here we got C is equal to P. And if we're working in the same limit that I was talking about, n goes to infinity, p goes to zero, uh, but it's constant, this is sort of like a one over n. Okay? Why is it pkc2? Yeah, the, the question is, let me write it over here. If, so you're interested in a particular node, it has k neighbors. So one, two, I mean, let's say this is node 10. One, two, uh, three, and then various others, and k. So there are k nodes, and you're looking at links between these. So there are kc2 possible links, but each one will be given a link with a probability p. So the average number of links you will actually see between one, two, three, four k there might be a link here, there might be a link here, there might be a link here. In this ensemble, the average number you will see is just p times this, because each link is given independently with the same probability p. It's the same binomial. It's just that now the binomial, yeah, the n you use is kc2. Okay? Okay, so we've got an estimate for, the, for this, and now let's end by getting a one final estimate for the diameter. So the diameter is actually a hard one to calculate for this ensemble. People have done it. Uh, it's, it's very like, mathematically dense to really do it rigorously. So all I'm going to do is give you a heuristic argument, and which will be very hand-waving. But imagine this. So you start with some node. It has, let me, keep it undirected. It has some k neighbors on average. You know how many neighbors it has, right? It has some name on average, we know how many neighbors it has. It has p n neighbors, right? It could have n possible links of which it will have on average p n links. So the number of nodes over here is on the order of p n, p n plus one if you want. Each of these will have on average, another Pn, right? So how many will there be two steps away from your node? So one step away was Pn, two steps away is going to be Pn squared. There are all these corrections. We can add all the corrections. The leading order term will still be Pn squared. Now you imagine you're going out from this node and going out. Every step you take, on average, you'll keep adding and adding and adding nodes, and it will go up exponentially. Now that can't go on forever. Even if it's a very large graph, at some point, the number of nodes, you're going to start repeating nodes. Your, the, the nodes that come out from this may not be completely independent of these. One of these links may actually go back, but these when you're looking at a very, very large graph, it turns out that those are all second order effects. And actually, as you go m steps, it's a fairly good, pretty good approximation that you will be covering p n to the power m nodes. So now one can ask, what's the diameter? The diameter is how many steps before you get to the entire graph, right? So how many steps? That means this would have to become equal to about n, right? So that means m log pn is equal to log n. So the diameter, the diameter turns out to be log n by log pn. 
And this, remarkably, turns out to be not as hand-waving and unrigorous uh, an argument as I've just made out. The way I've said it, you can easily think of lots of caveats. You can't continue this process without sort of running into nodes coming back. But it turns out if you do the actual calculation, which is too dense, I haven't ever done it myself, it turns out to be very, very similar. The scaling is exactly the same. There is a little geometric factor that sometimes comes in. So if you look at the diameter, it goes as log n by log pn. OK. So now at least we have one way, one set of comparisons. This was already nothing like a fat tail. And we need to think about, and I would urge you to think about it, and we can come back to this question next class. Is this high? Is this small? But at least we have now a null expectation that we can compare these values with. OK? Uh, so next time we'll come back, we'll look at other kinds of models, and we'll look at some more details about the kinds of structure that these uh, random graphs have, and maybe, if we have time, other kinds of random graphs also. Any questions? Sorry, I went over a little bit. Yep, it doesn't look very high, I agree. Especially, especially in a limit, we are somehow very often, actually we are, I should have mentioned this a little earlier, we are very often, I did mention this, but I should have started with this, we are very often interested in this limit where Pn is constant. In this limit, certainly, it's, imagine a large graph, it's very low. Yeah, so I would say this is surprising. This doesn't really match. This doesn't really match. This is pretty good. That's not bad. Especially if Pn is a constant, then it goes as log n. So your number of steps, your diameter, your maximum, your longest, shortest path is only log of the, the number of nodes. That actually turns out to be pretty good. So maybe next time I will come back and tell you something about how these compare actually with real, real numbers for real networks. Sorry, one second. OK, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Ah, references. Yes, I will. Is there a place we can put up on the website? Maybe, you know, I will, I will uh, get it put up on the website. Yeah? Because there are a whole bunch of different things with some categorization. Uh, so if you do, I mean, if you just want to look, even looking at Wikipedia erdos Reni graphs, if you want to look now, like before I put it up, you can get a fair amount of information. Yeah. Ah, so he's asking about the distribution of diameters. No, I'm not, actually, I don't think it's known, but what has been calculated for some of these cases is the distribution of the average path lengths. That's known. Uh, in, there is one, actually, there is one case uh, where you do know the distribution uh, of the diameters. Sorry, I was wrong. Uh, I do recall. It's very, very narrow. In these erdos reni graphs, uh, again, in this limit, where n, p, uh, n goes to infinity, p goes to 0, pn is a constant. Uh, but in fact, even more than this, uh, you need to add a couple of constraints. You need to be pn larger than 1, and I, I believe less than log n. If you're in this regime, then there are analytical results of the distribution of the diameter, and it's really narrow. So it's, it's, very, it's distributed around a very few values around this, this value. So yeah, it's surprisingly actually a really good estimate. Any other questions? OK. Yes, yes, I'm here for the tutorial. OK, thank you. See you at the tutorial or tomorrow.